Welcome to the Reverend Mel Show. And now, here's your host, Reverend Mel. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the Rev Mel Show on TSRnetwork.com, where real people talk about real kinky things with some amazing kinky people. And I'm really, really excited about my guest today. I've been trying to get her on the show forever, and we just have not been able to connect the times. Every time she was going to come into Los Angeles, wasn't able to get her in into the studio when we had the studio. But I finally pinned her down, not really pinned her down. But before we start with the show, I want to um, do a warm welcome to all the people that are watching this. Uh, if you come into the chat room, there's this little thing at the very top. If you click on a little little box and has an arrow on it, that will make the chat uh, come out as a pop-out chat so you can move it around. But um, um, I want to put out our Android app. Our Android app, we're starting to sell. People are starting to buy it. People are starting to really, you know, take us mobile. So I'm excited. And I am not sure, but I think we are broadcasting live on our Android app because if it goes onto YouTube, it goes live onto your Android app. So you can take TSR Network with you, which is a great thing to do. We'll be doing our iPhone app. Hopefully in a couple of weeks, we'll be getting that out there too. So if you have an iPhone, you'll be able to tap in on, on TSR being mobile also. But I want to put out the news this week um, to Newtown, Connecticut. I uh, was so saddened by, you know, waking up to um, to the news and all of the children that we lost and um, the beautiful faces that were brutally murdered by someone. Um, my heart goes out to that community. My heart goes out to the East Coast because they've gone through a lot. They've gone through September 11th. They've gone through Sandy. They've gone through this. And uh, to, to the families and to, to the friends of the children and to the, to the adults that died, um, may you heal. May you take time to reflect on um, the one wonderful fond memories that you have of the children and of these adults and my heart goes out to that community and I you know I say a prayer and um, it just saddens me and I did I did a, a, a painting on an iPod painting and I put it out on Facebook and all over the place and up on FetLife uh, it's called tears and it's just you know one a little bit of hair and, a, and an eye and tears coming down because I was so affected by it. It really made me extremely sad that somebody could really hurt innocent children like that. But um, my heart goes out to you. We have people that are coming into the chat room. We have Don. Welcome to the chat room, Don. Nice to see you. Um, and also, I want to make an announcement that this is going to be our last show for the year. We'll be back in January, but this will be the last show that we're doing, and I'm so excited about my guest. I am just so excited. I'm so glad that I'm going to be doing my last guest as, as this wonderful, wonderful person. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce my guest at the moment, and I'd like to introduce Susan Wright from the National Correlation of Sexual Freedom. Welcome. Woohoo! Hi. Hello, welcome. <laughs> it's great seeing you. <laughs> yeah, it's great seeing you too. <laughs> we've been we've been we've been chatting back and forth uh, and she wasn't able to see me and I was able to see her. <laughs> so, um I have tried so hard to get you on the show and I'm so excited about this and I'm going to pull up my uh there we go. Okay, let's talk. So, let's do a little background. So, how did you are the founder of the National Correlation of Sexual Freedom. And I probably say that wrong correlation because I'm very severely dyslexic. So if you want to repeat it, you're welcome to do that. It's National Coalition. Coalition! <laughs> See, I told you. <laughs> always, always. It's a group. It's a whole group of uh, coalition partners. We have uh, actually 96 coalition partners right now. They're um, educational and social groups and businesses, all kinky, polyamorous. Um, or swing related. Uh -huh. So, so it's it's um, mature adult related. I mean, oh yes. Um, one of the things I want to ask you is, is how did it all start? I mean, who well, was the brainchild yeah. behind all this, and how did you start this? Yeah, I started it. Um, I was actually working on a project for the National Organization for Women. Mm -hmm. I had been a now member since I was sixteen, 
and um, they had an anti SM policy. They equated SM with uh, violence against women, and they had this all mixed up in their their anti pornography literature and their um, you know all this other stuff anti pedestry. I don't know why that that's men and boys, but um, they. Um, so I started a project to try to get them to rescind this mm -hmm. um, anti-SM policy, and it took several years. And while I was working on this, they finally did rescind it in, in 1999. We got them, the now members of the national organization, to, to change it to accept the diversity of women, um, sexuality. But while I was working on this, I kept on having uh, woman after woman write to me and saying, oh, I lost my child custody. Oh, my family's rejected me. They kicked me out of the house because I'm into um, SM. And um, I just kept getting more and more of these things, and I realized there really is a need for somebody to help these people. There's a need for advocacy for kink. And so I went to the groups that were really well established. The, the first five groups in NCSF were the um, National Leather Association International, Gay Male SM Activists, Black Rose, Society of Janice, and the Eulenspiegel Society. So these were all the really old, well established groups back in 1997. And I said, listen, why don't we just form a coalition and um, kind of as an umbrella and we can do the media advocacy. We can do the advocacy to try to change the laws, to do the things that these educational groups really didn't want to do. And they liked that idea. And so it's just kind of grown from there. Well, I, I'm not sure, but I think that there was in Detroit when the news cameras went into a private dungeon, I think mm -hmm. that your organization was instrumental in getting the faces blocked out. Oh yes, um, instantly we started getting calls from people when the promos came on the TV mm -hmm. and they had sort of made a vague attempt to, to, to kind of fuzz out people's eyes but you know they showed hairstyles, they showed body shape, they showed tattoos which are very identifying uh -huh. and um, I had a couple of women call me almost immediately saying oh my god you know I've been recognized and one woman said it's my, my ex-husband's new wife oh, wow. just called me. And yeah, and I'm worried about because my daughter, we share mm -hmm. custody of my daughter. So right away I knew this was a really serious problem. So I started um, calling the, um, the news station because they, they kind of were like a little local expose news thing. And I really just kind of hit everybody I could until I found somebody who was receptive. Mm -hmm. And I just told them, this is, a, this is a problem. Do you really want to threaten somebody's child custody? Do you really want to hurt these innocent people. They have nothing to do. It was all about a completely different story of some man who was kind of loosely associated with kink um, who was alleged to have, have um, murdered his wife. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to put forward, listen, you can't just hurt these innocent people and do this. And to their credit, they completely blurred out everybody's face. They blurred out any identifying um, things in the in the air in the in the club because they really didn't want the club outed. Yeah. Um, and because um, that's our biggest problem is keeping these venues, you know. And um, they used a lot of the sound bites that I sent them. Uh -huh. You know, they kind of the whole tone of the story. We managed to change it from this like, oh my god, freak show to you know here alternative lifestyle. <laughs> And that's a huge that's a huge step forward. I mean, I couldn't get them to take it down completely. It was sweeps week, and they were really into this whole thing, and they wouldn't stop it completely. But when you really approach them and on a sort of human to human level, you are able to have an impact. And I was able to have an impact in that case as well. And I I really used FetLife, which was wonderful, to kind of help organize the Detroit community mm -hmm. um, and reach people who were being affected by this and you know, was sending personal statements of people who were being affected by this and people were sending letters and it was extremely effective and it had to happen instantly yes. because the promos were for that night. Yes. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing because I'm originally from Detroit and I was going back home to Detroit in July to visit my family and that came out just before that but we also had, we also had the, the death in San Diego of the young girl that was killed and it was all over the news media yes. and TSR Network ready for this was in the in the news 
as really? they they flash tsrnetwork.com and we had over 250 if you if you t do tsrnetwork.com in the news it had over 250 different articles written with tsr network into it it freaked me out and then the thing happened in detroit i mean it was just the only time that we get any news is when someone's been killed or hurt yeah, I mean that's that's been typical for a long time. Um, I deal with all the the horror show stuff, the sensationalized stuff. Um, the good thing is that this has changed actually in the past year with Fifty Shades of Grey. We're actually getting a lot more positive media. We're getting a lot more um, people writing articles to try to find out well what is this kink world? What is this all about? And they use that hook of Fifty Shades of Grey. Just fine. It's a fiction romance novel. It's like most fiction romance novels, it's not real, but it's really somehow sparked a conversation, a national conversation that I have never seen in the media before, um, where people are now, you know, the media is really covering it very positively, and so I think we need to really kind of get on that wave and, and do education while we have this chance. So it's a good thing about Fifty Shades of Grey because last week was my show on Fifty Shades of Grey and we talked about if it was a, we're going so mainstream and if it's a good thing. And when you and I were in conversation before the show started and I told you that I had 25 new people watching, I mean coming to my class at the Lear de Sade and most of them have read, the females have read Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah. And it, it's had a huge impact. The, uh, groups all over the country are reporting that there's a lot of new people coming, single women as well as couples. Mm -hmm. And uh, businesses, of course, have been reported in the media saying that it's really helped their business, um, sex toys and things like that. Um, so we know it's having an impact. And 25 new people. I mean, when did you ever get 25 new people at once? <laughs> I, I get, it's amazing because I have taught maybe about over 8,000 people in, in an eight year period of time at the Lear de Sade. I mean, I've been doing it every other weekend and I've only missed a couple days. But I think because of the fact that um, education is so important and because of, of, of your website, I mean, I want to read their mission statement, okay? The NCF mission, the NC, here I go again, the NCSF mission statement is this. The NCSF is committed to creating a political, legal, and social environment in the U.S. that advocates equal rights for consenting adults who engage in alternative sexual and relationship expressions. The NCS, I, there I go again, it's my dyslexia coming out, aims to advance the rights of and advocate the sense consenting adults in the BDSM leather fetish swing and polyamorous communities. We pursue our vision through direct services, education, advocacy. I can't say that word. Help me. Advocacy. Advocacy. Thank you. <laughs> advocacy. <laughs> and outreach in conjunction with our partners to directly benefit these communities. I mean that that is a, is a, is a huge huge mission statement especially for people that have to hide who they are. I mean doctors and lawyers and teachers can't come out. They have to really be in fear of their jobs. Yes, it's definitely true. That's one of our programs is our incident reporting and response program mm -hmm. and that was created to um to try to connect people with the help that they need, um, and not just people, but businesses and groups as well. Um, and that could be people who are suffering some sort of media um, crisis, or people who are having a child custody problem. And a lot of what we do is we connect them with the materials that they need to educate other people about kink, so that they're not discriminated against. Well, we are discriminated against. I mean, once once we put on you know the collars and the leather and we walk out of our houses and people look at us and go oh my god look what they're dressed up like I mean people start you know spreading rumors about us and start talking really bad about what we do because people don't I understand that this is consensual how do you get the media to understand that this is consensual when we say safe sane and consensual most of the people will go well you don't look like you're doing something safe if you're doing edge play um, sane not a sane person would be doing this and who would consent to this so how would you approach uh, in the media changing the viewpoint of that 
Well, one of the ways we do it is actually to talk about the discrimination and persecution. I think that um, we were treated very lightly, we're made jokes of, um, we're sensationalized, and um, I realized that uh, the reporters really are looking for a new angle. They, 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 can't, they want to, to find something new and be able to be the person to come out there and say something about it. So I really early on found out that if I talk about the harm that's being done to us through this stigma, it humanizes us mm -hmm. and it makes, it makes other people care about, about this. Um, and, um, and then the, the other things are our, our, our projects and programs. I mean, like you just said, like, is this insane? Is this sane or not? Um, the DSM Revision Project, the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual for the American Psychiatric Association. They are going to have a new revision next uh, spring in 2013. And we did a lot of work to educate the paraphilia sub work group about BDSM. They had no idea, they said they had no idea, that this discrimination was occurring. I mean, um, courts use the diagnostic manual um, and they would use it to say, well, some it says in here if you are kinky and you don't want to give it up that you know you're mentally ill and so I can't give you your your child custody or I have to you know um, do a harsher sentencing uh, if it's a criminal trial so um, we got them to alter their criteria and they have stated that what they're going to do is you know they split the sexual behavior the paraphilia is unusual sexual behavior and then there's going to be paraphilic disorder. Uh -huh. People who are like the sadistic serial killers who do things non-consensually, um, uh, people who self-harm um, and, and hurt themselves and can't control their urges. Things like that may be still considered in certain circumstances to be mental health problems, but it actually clearly states people who do BDSM you know, are not mentally ill. And I think that that will have a huge impact. We're already just using the proposed criteria. It hasn't even come out yet. And we just refer courts to the proposed criteria. And already we've had just a, a huge uptick in success in child custody cases. Well, in, so, the, ch in the chat room we have Dawn. And Dawn said, I could have used the, the National Coalition. <laughs> Help me! I can't say that. Coalition. <laughs> Coalition. Everyone in the chat room, they all know that I can't pronounce certain words. I'm severely dyslexic and I have a hard time pronouncing words, but that's okay. That's just who I am. She said about six years ago when I lost my little girl to a custody battle due to being in the lifestyle and my family finding out. I mean, that that is so sad for me it to is read. It's sad. And, and, and Six years ago, yes. I mean, we had a, maybe a 20% success rate. It was mm -hmm. very bad. I mean, even when you came to NCSF, because of the DSM, um, because that was in the DSM, judges would look at that and they would take it as authoritative. So it really, and it took, you know, I've been working on this project for over two years. It's going on three years now. Um, to just change that because we knew if we could change that, um, we could have an impact on on hundreds of thousands of people's lives. And it's very sad for Dawn. I really feel bad for her. I mean, these are the these are the cases that I hear about that keep me volunteering, that keep me coming back and helping people because there's a real need out there. So people can can people can donate. They can and, and what would I mean give the website for them to go to the and to do donation to keep this going. It's at www.ncsfreedom Dot org. So it's National Coalition Sexual NCS Freedom spelled out uh, dot org, and it's really important to donate to support NCSF. We have a tiny budget. Um, we help uh, 600 people a year. We I do media interviews um, every week. I do media interviews. Uh, we have our kinkaware professionals list. We have all kinds of things that we'll talk about, and we do it for a tiny amount of money. It's under a hundred thousand dollars a year. We keep all this going. And that's strictly from donations from the BDSM community, from kinky people, from groups doing fundraisers. We don't get grants. You know, nobody's supporting us. We are really, the kink community is on our own. <laughs> you know, nobody's <laughs> reaching out to help us. Um, it was actually <laughs> ironic. There was an, there was an op-ed in The Advocate today. Uh -huh. And um, it was a wonderful op-ed that said, you know, here, this is the next frontier in LGBT fight is, Kink is the next frontier. Oh yeah, and but you know what? The comments 
were awful. Mm -hmm. The comments were just like, what are you talking about? Why is the advocate doing this? And you should take this down. And it was just one after the other after the other. And there was a, you know, we, we realized this and put it out on our Facebook, the NCSF Facebook page. And so people started responding and I responded and we were starting to do education and the advocate took it down. <gasps> they just took it down like it never existed. Oh my just God. wiped it out. And it's like, wow, we can't even have this conversation. No, it, you know? it was really amazing because back in July before I lost my studio, um, I had to move because I lost my lease. It wasn't, no, none, none of my pro it was, wasn't because of me. It was something else that happened. But we were going to be doing the kink awareness movement. We were, going to, we were going to be going down to the federal building in, West, in, in, in Westwood. Some of us would wear masks and some of us wouldn't, and we would wear we would hold signs saying, "I'm a teacher, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a kinkster, mm -hmm. I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a kinky person, I'm I'm a mother, I'm the, all these different things to support support the freedom to be adults and to to be able to do this, and because we're we're really looked down upon, and yeah. that's that's the whole thing behind BDSM Pride Day, because we do BDSM Pride Day every year, because we need some good press, we need people to understand that so many people are involved in this and for your organization to do what it does I mean you know it is, it is a bloody miracle I understand it's hard to keep it going because nobody wants to invest and donate money to a site that has to do with adults or grants no they really don't I mean we've gone everywhere mm -hmm. we've gone to Playboy we've gone to Hustler we've gone to all the big foundations the LGBT foundations you know, you know, maybe things will change. You know, that's why something like Fifty Shades of Grey comes along, and I have to appreciate it because, at the very least, people are talking about us. You know, and, and they're not talking about us in the same sentence as somebody who's murdered somebody. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, I mean, that's a huge, huge step forward for us. And with the movies coming out, hopefully, we'll have a chance to to do more. I mean, I really do look at it as sort of our stonewall. I mean, it's sort of what broke through this this wall that I've been for, for at this point, 15 years. Mm -hmm. It really has been 15 years of the same um, stigma, the same misunderstandings, the same, you know, stereotypes. And then suddenly Fifty Shades of Grey came along and people are willing to listen. And so we've just got to talk and talk and talk as much as we can while people are willing to listen to change this. Yeah, I mean, we have, at the Lurida side, we have roughly probably about 4,000, 5,000 members. Thank God they all don't come at the same time or else I'd never get to play. But we have so many people that, that are in hiding, that, that mm. can't come out you know, to their families. We, I have a friend of mine who was in a, a, a court case with child custody case, and uh, her, her husband at the time basically was, was denied rights to see his own son. And it's really a shame of what people can do because they don't understand. So I want to ask you something. What is Consent Count Program? The Consent Counts um, Program is something that actually started out of creating change, which is NGLTF. That's the big activist conference for the um, um, LGBT community. And um, every year we hold like a leather caucus, and it's where the LGBT activists who are also kinky can get together and talk about what they think is the most important projects for us to work on. And um, they decided one year, it was several years ago at this point, actually it might be four years ago, that um, decriminalizing BDSM, working on the assault laws. Mm -hmm. Because right now, as it stands, consent is not a defense to assault mm -hmm. in um, appellate law. Mm -hmm. You know, law, case law is made, um, it's at the appellate level. So you have to appeal a court case and then have it uh, ruled before it really sets precedent for other cases. And unfortunately, we have a bunch of cases that, um, you know, they reiterate this over and over again. Consent is not a defense to assault. Consent. Well, what is assault? And you have to look at the assault laws, and there's a bunch of different assault laws. I mean, there's the model penal code, which is it's actually pretty close, I think, to what our community would agree would work, which is, you know, it's assault if it if it's not consensual, it's assault. Mm -hmm. And in some cases it doesn't it has to be barely even touching somebody and it's assault. Yeah. Um, but if it's consensual, it only rises to the level of assault if you do, you know, permanent disfigurement, 
if you cause a substantial risk of death. You know, real extreme things like that. Um, but other state laws don't have that. They have, if you cause somebody pain, even if it's consensual. Well, you know, <laughs> that's us. <laughs> and so we have people over and over again who end up in these, in these situations where they're facing, you know, criminal court, whether it's through a domestic violence situation, um, somebody hears something going on, and even though both people say it was consensual, they arrest um, the top and take them in, and then they have to prove mm -hmm. this was not domestic violence. Or, um, or it can be other other types of cases where somebody says it was not consensual, but you know it's trying to get back at somebody. It, you know, and then we have the cases where people who were actually really assaulted um, try to report it to the police, and they don't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. So we sort of have a gamut of of problems here that we have to deal with. So um, as this project started going through the community. Um, they realized we really needed somebody to kind of head it up, and they kind of gave it to NCSF, and mm -hmm. we agreed to take it on. And what we've been doing the past year is really having a discussion on consent to try to figure out what does consent mean to our community. We had a giant survey. We had over 5,000 people answer it, and I'm almost done. Um, I, we had a wonderful statistician analyze it for us. Um, and uh, so she sent me all the data, and I've kind of pulled all the numbers out of it, and we're looking at all the comments. and. Um, it's really given us a lot of good information, and we're also writing lots of more um, information about, um, you know, what do you do if you're assaulted, mm -hmm. or what do you do if what do you do if you were falsely accused of assault? And so we're putting all of this information into this one project, and we're working quite actively with FetLife as well. And, um, and that it's, it's, it's a we can't how can I say it? one of the biggest problems that we have in our community is that we don't have the ability to police ourselves. And there is assaults going on. There is, you know, people that are that are that are going way past the limits and assaulting people. And you know, some of them are pillars in our community that are protected by the fact that they're pillar in our community. It really, it really is a is a terrible situation for a lot of submissives that do not know that they can use their voice. And when they do speak up, they're crucified. Yeah, it's it's a real problem, and one of the things that NCSF has is almost done with now is called a guide for groups, mm -hmm. because we've been contacted by so many groups. How do we deal with consent violations that take place at a party or at an event? Um, you know, uh, what, should we have a policy? So we created a sample consent policy um, for the things that you need to make sure that that your attendees know about, and we've got how do you deal with it if a consent um, violation happens. How do you deal with a member? How do you how do you uh, ban a member uh, who you feel is not right for the group? And and letting groups know you have the right to exclude somebody if they don't fit with the culture of your group. I mean, if consent is very important to your group, if somebody's violating that, don't let them in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of the problem with um, the kink community is this whole my your kink is okay, my kink is okay, which is great but it can go too far. I think as a community we need to really kind of step back and realize that's what a community is. A community sets certain social standards of what's acceptable and what's not and our groups are the backbone of this community. They're the ones that can enforce those social contracts that we have. So we think that that's going to be really helpful. It won't do, it won't solve any problems like the people who hook up and you know are doing it on their own time but what we're hoping is if we can get the groups to really support this and to really spread the information about well this is consent you know we, we recommend you don't renegotiate in the middle of a scene um, for example that's an important one we hear about a lot of consent violations because mm -hmm. two people or three people or four people will negotiate a scene they'll set limits they'll, they'll have the scene They'll get kind of to the end, and you know the sub is flying in subspace, and the top leans in and goes, "Well, I want to kind of revisit this whole punching thing. You know, I really want to do that." And the sub is like, "Going well, sure, anything. You know, cut my arm off. Go ahead. You know, not not really in a right mind to consent." And then something else happens, whether it's more activities that they hadn't agreed to or expressly said they didn't want to do, or sex will happen, even though they said they didn't want it to happen. Um, and so, I mean, I think that that's something that needs to be put out there. You don't renegotiate in the middle of a scene because mm -hmm. you may not really have consent if somebody's not in their right mind. Yep. 
I agree 100% with you. I mean, that I mean that is not a time to negotiate when someone is flying in subspace. And subspace is, is, is a precious place for someone to go. I know yes. there's a case in, in, I think it's Missouri, that there's oh. a gentleman <laughs> that uh, ended up... Yeah, Ed, Ed Bagley. Yeah, well, she, she case. well, she's a. I, I think it's the same one. She's alive. She was she was in the hospital with a heart attack or with from electrical play, and her family went in and um, basically, um, you know, deemed her un, unfit to you know handle her own life, and he's now facing you know kidnapping and rape charges. It's, yeah, that's a that's a serious case, and um, in the Bagley case. He and his wife were taking care of a girl, mm -hmm. a girl who came to them at 16, and they were, she was living in their house, and they were, you know, in a parental sort of um, capacity to her. She had been in foster homes. She really hadn't been taught much. Um, they say that she might or might not be mentally slow, um, but she certainly didn't know, have a lot of social skills and had to be taught a lot of things. Um, and uh, on her 18th birthday, she signed a slave contract, and mm -hmm. um, this man, you know, tattooed her with the word slave, uh, some sort of figure that, that meant slave, and did some extreme things to her. And, yeah, he, he then continued to do extreme things to her for years and got other people involved in it. And so his, um, he was charged because she had a heart attack and went to the hospital, yep. and she started telling him why this happened. And his co-defendants all pled guilty. And um, just last week, his wife, Marilyn Bagley, pleaded guilty. She had stood up for him the whole time, saying it was consensual. We were, oh. in, yeah, we were oh. in a consensual triad. This was all BDSM. But you know, she, you know, they yeah. they came out to Los Angeles, and and she was shooting with photographers here. The girl yeah. was, oh, yeah. I mean, was, and that's why it's federal trafficking laws because they cross state laws, <gasps> and he was making money off of her. So they decided to charge him under the federal trafficking law, which is you know she's still on FetLife and still contacting people and asking them to be her master. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, Marilyn Bagley has now pled guilty, and <gasps> in, in the plea, she actually said, um, uh, yeah, I did this because I was being abused, and um, and so he kind of switched his attention to her. So basically, Marilyn's going to get probation. The prosecution said during the, this rather surprise hearing that happened um, that here we have a case of a um, a victim turned perpetrator in the, in the form of Marilyn Bagley. Susan, so, this could happen to any of us. This could happen to any of us. Yeah, well, it definitely could. I mean, there are there are false accusations out there, without a doubt. I mean, it's one of the easiest things in the world if you're mad at somebody, you know, to accuse them of assault. I mean, you have a few bruises on your body. You go to the police. You say, he assaulted me. I didn't expect this to happen. And they get arrested. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of people come to us saying that. And, in fact, we get so many people come, coming to us with false accusations um, that I think that, in some ways, NTSF does see that that that's a bigger problem than most people think. Although, when you also think about it, a lot of people are blackmailed, uh, threatened with being outed. You know, it's it's a huge rampant problem in the community, like the outing of events. You know, these dangerous insiders that because they don't like somebody, they out an event, they mm -hmm. send a letter to the media. So it's all in the same sort of um, problem. Because of the stigma, some people use that stigma that we have at against us mm -hmm. and they use it against people when they're mad. Mm -hmm. It's a horrible thing. I wish it would just stop dead. If it did, most of our problems honestly would go away at mm -hmm. this point. Um, we're really the biggest danger to ourselves right now. Yeah. And it interferes because then you hear about somebody who says I was assaulted and you doubt them. And, and you see that happening over and over again. Especially if they're accusing somebody who's well known in the community or in a group. And that, that's harming the people who are being hurt because then they're not being taken seriously. And that's a huge problem as well. We cannot allow um, people to continue to violate people's consent, to assault them, to rape them, and call it BDSM. I mean, that's not why I'm here. You know, I'm here to defend consenting adults. I don't want to, I don't want to have to, to, to defend these people who are hiding in our community and, and raping over and over and over again, which, yep. which has been happening. 
and people do do that and they do things to people that they shouldn't touch them inappropriately no means no in our lifestyle that has to be constant and when it's not and you can't you can't negotiate while you're in subspace while you're gone and it's, and it's not even just even no means no there's there's an absence of of yes an absence of no doesn't mean yes yes a lot of these people i mean i know it i'm submissive Sexually, um, no. See, I was no. just going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, in my my daily life, I'm an activist. I'm out there. I'm, you know, but sexually, I'm extremely submissive, and I've been in a position where I just couldn't speak up. Uh huh. And um, and especially new people coming into the community, um, they they hear that there's there are certain expectations of them being in these roles, and and um, I mean, some people even question, well. Can't they call me slave and give me orders because I am a slave? It's like, well, no, you haven't consented to them doing that. You know, so just even addressing people um, in in the royal name, it, it can really cause problems for people. So we have a lot of education to do. Well, one of the first things that when people come into my class at the Lure de Sade, the first thing, this is I always address this in every one of my classes to every single submissive, slave, or bottom, or whatever they think they are. I always say your voice is your best weapon. Your voice mm -hmm. is your best tool to use. And it's really important that we keep Okay. <laughs> it did it again. Okay. There everybody, it's back up. It's funny. I don't know what happened. That's hysterical. I see there it goes. <laughs> it likes to do that, but it's, it's still it's still broadcasting. Sometimes it did this um the other day too. But one of the things I want to ask you, okay. You have you have a whole list of kink professionals that that are kink aware. So these are people that are in different types of um, like doctors and, and lawyers and Indian chiefs or whatever but um, please to explain a little bit about the kink professionals because it's a great great concept it was started by Ray Bannon in the early 90s and um, he was the one who worked on the first DSM revision in 1994 where they made strides to Because he realized that you know people need to to be able to access kink-aware therapists or kink-aware doctors or kink-aware lawyers when they're in trouble, um, and the kink-aware professionals list is one of our most important programs um, that we maintain and we go out and we try to recruit other professionals, and we've really expanded it. I mean, we have every we have we even have like an other professionals uh, a section where we have uh, mediators and realtors and private investigators. Um, we have life coaches, we have spiritual advisors and wedding officiators, um, and we have health and wellness practitioners who are um, MD as well as not MD um, and internet-based businesses because internet-based businesses, if you're an adult business, you have certain issues you have to face and deal with. So if you need um, you know, professional services and it involves your kink in any sort of way, which your doctor, your mental health, you know, if you have a legal problem, um, it's really helpful to go to this list and find a kink work professional in your area. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many so many people to choose from on your list, which is great. And you also um, you did a little a little thing about um, kink coming to Harbor. How big of a deal is that? I mean, that hit like wildfire all over the it place. It did, and I was kind of a little surprised, but I think it shows the impact of Fifty Shades of Grey, quite frankly, because you know we've had college kink groups. For a long time, in fact, Cuffs, one of the ones that they mentioned over and over again, that re that got such resistance, and, and the media coverage was horrible, like about six years ago about that group. Columbia University, the Conversio Virium, they've had different, you know, problems and media blow-ups. Um, so when the Harvard group kind of came out and, and, you know, they got accepted and the media started covering it, it, the tone was completely different. It was like, wow, isn't this interesting? You know, this Ivy League bastion is is kind of a little bit wilder than you thought it was. Um, it was a real nice change to see that happen. So how is your outreach to u different universities? I mean, are you reaching out to to the younger generation that are coming in that are in, in the college age? I mean, are you 
Is there any programs that you have for, for We them? don't have an actual program to do that, although it certainly would be a smart idea and it's something that we would like to do and have yeah. talked about doing. It's the same thing as the TNG, supporting the mm -hmm. TNG groups around the country. We certainly do do outreach uh, to universities um, on a regular basis. There's all kinds of activists who go to you know, graduate schools and, um, and uh, social services and mental health and, and talk about kink. It, it's um, really quite common at this point uh, that we are, you know, the outreach happens into the local community. Um, so we are doing that, um, but yeah, I would like to see, you know, kink support groups in every college. I think it would be really important. So, I, I would like to see it because I think we could help change the dialogue mm -hmm. um, on, co on college campuses about consent violations and date rape. Mm -hmm. I think that if you had a kinky group out there saying, well, this is what consent is, you know, and hey, not just girls, protect yourself from being raped, but hey, guys, here's what it looks like if you rape, you know, here's what you don't do because that's rape, you know, and start teaching uh, the people who are actually contributing to the problem to stop it at the source. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that college BDSM groups would be really helpful in doing that. Well, I'm, I'm from the age of where we didn't have date rape. There was no name for it. Mm -hmm. Many of us were raped on dates. And we were so ashamed of the fact that we allowed ourselves to get into that situation. I mean, yeah. this younger generation, I mean, we you know, I'm a, ch I'm a child from the 60s, so I understand that there's a lot of changes. Yeah, no, there's a, and there is a lot of um, victims blame themselves. Mm -hmm. they, they immediately look, because it's, it's a loss of control. Somebody has taken that power away from you. And in some ways, it helps, I think, people to, to try to think of, well, what did I do to contribute to this? What can I do? in the future to not have this happen again. It's, it's, in some ways it's a way to try to get control back, but it's very insidious because, you know, victims shouldn't blame themselves. They are not responsible for this in any way whatsoever. And um, it's the person who hurt them that's responsible. But do you feel that because a submissive or a slave or a bottom feels that they don't have the right to say no or to speak up for, their, for themselves, that th that's the reason why they feel guilty and that's the reason why they hold it in and they will tell their friends and that's when all the right. rumors and all the craziness starts it's definitely true um, we need to be empowering our submissives um, which is our tops we, have, we need to be telling everybody you have a self responsibility you, you do have a responsibility to speak up um, and whether you're a top or a bottom you have a responsibility to set limits mm -hmm. for yourself anybody who goes out there and says I have no limits you're not, you're not doing yourself a service, you're not doing your tops mm -hmm. any good. I mean, certainly if I was a top, I would never play with somebody like that because how do you know? How do you know if you cross some sort of line with them? Um, I also think that safe words, I used to think safe words were for the sub mm -hmm. um, and in teaching the sub, you have a responsibility, you can stop this at any time, you're the one who can decide when it's gone too far. Um, but at Somewhere along the way, I, I realized safe words are really great for tops, too. Uh -huh. Because um, if you have an established safe word, it, one of the best ways if you're accused of assault is to say, listen, our safe word was coconuts. Mm -hmm. And she never said coconuts, or he never said coconuts. Um, and it, especially if you have that in writing, some sort of email or chat, um, it, it can really help... help um, you establish the fact that there was consent. There, you know, people can feel bad after a scene. People can, can feel remorse. They can feel regret. They can feel really awful. And we need to tell people that that doesn't mean that it wasn't consensual. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, it, it just means that your experience was not good. <laughs> and that can happen. And, um, but um, it's that self-empowerment, self-responsibility. But I think what's happening right now is too many people are out there just kind of trying to feel their way and figure this out because we haven't really talked about the specifics of consent yeah. in terms of what is consent? What is coercion? When are yeah. you being pressured into something? When are you being kind of forced into something or manipulated into something? I mean, you hear a lot about um, online sort of relationships yeah. where um, uh, submissives allow the top to take control of certain aspects of their life and they can actually 
you know, get them into a sexual state where they're they're denying themselves to where they're like mentally like kind of not completely with it. You know, <laughs> you know, you can be manipulated even when somebody's not standing right in front of you. So we need to teach people how to recognize when this is happening. Um, and then, you know, people are going to make mistakes. We're, we're playing on the edge here, and we have to allow ourselves the room to make mistakes and, and take responsibility for that ourselves when that happens. When you are in the role of as dominant, and if you have an alternative motive to do something, you can manipulate anybody, especially mm -hmm. a submissive or a slave, to be able to meet your you know your needs to be able to do the things that they would never ever dream of doing because you're the dominant that gives us so much control and we can really hurt people I mean if we really aren't careful I mean, I think the motto is I will I will I will hurt you but I'll never harm you is so important in our lifestyle and we have to we have to educate people that harm is different from hurt uh, there is a difference between abuse and um, you know BDSM and uh, and it's not just, it's not just, um, you know, there are some universals. And I think we need to start talking about that more instead of just being like, well, I don't want to get involved in that. I don't know what's happening there. Well, I think we do have a social responsibility, um, uh, especially when it comes to the, pe the predators, the real predators among us that are doing this over and over again. Yep. And we do have a lot of predators among us, and which is really bad. And we can't call them out because when we do, we get attacked. And mm -hmm. because they're protected, they're protected. Well, that's why we want you to report. Okay. That's why NTSF is working so hard on creating um, these materials to educate people about what really happens when you try to report a crime to the police. Are you going to be immediately outed? So, you know, the, people have lots of questions. So, is that the incident reporting and response? No, this is something new. This is what we're doing as part of the Consent Counts program. I've been working with um, a bunch of people, uh, social service, victim service. Um, people who are involved in the consent culture movement and the naming names of abusers on FetLife. Uh -huh. um, people who are really involved in trying to, to grapple with these issues. And we're, we're creating these um, facts um, uh, about, you know, was I assaulted? You know, what does assault look like? What do I do if I was assaulted? You know, what happens when I report to the police? So um, we're get, we're, that's along with, like, the guide for groups. We're starting to roll out this information. Mm -hmm. um, because I, it, there's just such a, people don't realize what's involved in it. I think if we really educate people and then um, we teach groups how to help somebody report, <laughs> you know, a crime to the police. Um, and we encourage groups, you know, if a consent violation happens, you know, you have to actually go with the person to report it to the police. You have to send a staff member. You can't just, like, kind of turn your back on this. You have to really accept responsibility as a group. I mean, and there's some liabilities you have to face as well if something like this happens in your space. So it is something that has to be dealt with. And um, I think that if we can get these materials out there and educate people, um, that reporting is really not as scary as it sounds. They really do protect victims. Mm -hmm. They really do protect your privacy. Um, and in fact, most most crimes are reported are not are not prosecuted. Mm -hmm. um, but if say if I report a dom. That, that violated my consent and had sex with me while I was tied up. I go to the police, I report him. They may decide, because it's in a BDSM context, which they often do, that it's not a strong enough case for them to pursue. But then, what happens if the next woman he does this to goes to the police and reports him? I'm telling you, prosecutors love that. Mm -hmm. They love to have two victims who are willing to testify against somebody for something that they've done that's very similar. Well, then suddenly they're going to perk up and go, wow, this is something we can pursue. And they will protect your privacy. I mean, look at the Bagley case. They protect, they're protect. they completely protecting her privacy, and this is a huge sensationalized case. Yeah. It is really getting national media. Well, it's in the Bible I mean, Belt also. I mean, yeah. it's, I mean it's, this and guy doesn't have a chance. Right. So if, if, if they're protecting her privacy, can you can imagine what it's going to be like? Because most people plead. You don't even end up having to go to court. If, if a prosecutor then you know, goes after this guy and says, I have two people that are willing to say you did this to them. Um, you know, we're taking you to court. 90% of the time, the person is going to take a plea deal. Mm -hmm. so, you, so the victim doesn't even have to go to court. And look what you've done. You know, you've stopped somebody. You've, you've gotten justice. You know, you haven't let them get away with it. 
And, and it's a much easier process, I think, than most people realize. And there are also victim services, which I've been doing a lot of outreach to. The anti-violence projects around the country um, are educated about edu LGBT issues. And, um, and they're willing to be educated about kink issue, issues. I have six of them across the country that, you know, you could call them from anywhere and tell them what happened to you, get counseling. They will hook you up with the victim services in your um, city. They, the victim services will help you report, so it's not just you going into the police alone. Um, so if you don't have somebody to go with you to help you do this, you can get help from the professionals who know how to do it. So we're just, we're just gathering all this information and we're going to be putting it out there for everybody so that we can hopefully change. Um, you know, there's a new sheriff in town. I really think that we need to change this because in our survey, the consent survey that we did, we found 30% had suffered some kind of consent violation. 15% had had their safe word ignored. Mm -hmm. Their previously negotiated safe word, they safe worded and it was ignored by their top. I can't stand that. There's yeah. no way I can support that. That is way too much. I mean, we're sitting here priding ourselves that, that we're educating people and we're teaching people how to do this in a safe, sane, and consensual way. Well, we need to back that up a little bit better than we're doing. Well, I agree with you 100%. I don't, can't tell you how many people have come to my class. And after my classes, I wish that I would have came to your class before I would have went out and gotten abused. And some of them have gotten abused. I mean... It's happening in like the first few years. I mean, yeah. it really is a, you can see because we ask how many years people are in the community and have you had this happen and it really is like four years. The first four years is when this is the danger period for yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah, new meat. New meat. When there's new mm -hmm. meat out there, they are, they are raw and you know, they can be abused and for the sake of... When I, when I say the word dom, I'm referring to both male and female. I, I never say... It does happen. It's both. It, really it is, is both. And, and, and people can be abusive, you know. And, and it can be, and the, and the victim can be male or female or yep. trans, mm -hmm. um, intersex. Um, it really, I think more so in the kink community than almost anywhere, it really does cross gender because yeah. we're playing with power. We're overtly playing with power, and we have males and females who are on top, and males and females who are on bottom. So we really do have a non-gender specific um, situation going on here. Okay, I want to ask you a hypothetically quest, a hypothetical question. Okay, let's say that I was in a, I was a submissive, which we know I'm not, so we know how hypothetical this one is. Um, <laughs> and I met a dom, you know, I'm going to say a dominatrix because, you know, I'm going to act like I'm bisexual, <laughs> even though I am, you know. Uh, and she <laughs> abused me, and she did things to me that I did not consent to, and she hurt me. And, um, you know, so what would I, would, what would I do? W would I email, email, you know, your organization, and what... Would you refer people that could help me in my community or in my area? I mean, how does that work? Because, you know, I know you don't have 50 million people all over the place, which someday we may, or someday you might. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how? I hope so. Yeah, I mean, does only how can how can you help everyone, and how can you do it? And you know, what's the best recourse for someone to do? Is you know, well, I'm, yeah, they can contact NCSF. Mm -hmm. They can contact me um, specifically. I, since I've started really doing this work, um, I've had people contact me specifically. And what I do is I hook them up with these um, uh, these victim services mm -hmm. um, and so that they can get the counseling that they need because it, it takes that to decide what you want to move forward. You know what I mean? You really do need um, trained mm -hmm. people to help you in that situation. And then NCSF has in the past... Um, when we've been contacted, we'll contact somebody in the local community and say, listen, can you help this person go to the police and report this? Um, you know, we'll, we'll actually reach out to people to, to actually have them like a buddy system. I mean, it's not something you want to do alone. Um, so we'll have somebody that we know in the community who is level-headed and smart and has experience with this in some way and can help them out. Um, we, uh, you know, we... It's, it's something I think we need to do more of. I'd like to see us do more of, but I'm not sure if, if NCSF can keep operating at this level. Mm -hmm. um, we're volunteers, you know, so it's, 
it's very difficult to ask people to work a full-time job and then, you know, give 20 hours a week to NCSF. Um, so our incident reporting and response is actually in trouble right now. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to keep it going in the new year. We our our budget last year was ninety five thousand. This year it's seventy five thousand. Is how much money we've made we brought in, um, and that's a severe cut in our resources. Well, I would I would love to um, if we can put together a commercial for you and run it on all of our shows. That would be an honor. Oh, that would to be do great. That. <laughs> I mean, it's really important that we support each other and support our community. And you've done so much great work. But I want to ask you some pr pr professional questions. I mean, pr personal questions. Okay. <laughs> Okie doke. So you're submissive. Yes. How long have you been submissive? <laughs> you know, I think I have been my whole life. I just didn't realize it until I was in my mid-twenties, quite frankly. <laughs> um, and uh, I was one of those people that when I found the community, it just, I was like, you know, hallelujah, I have found my people. Um, and and, and um, how, old, how old were you? when you, Was it in your twenties? How old were you when you found it? I was pretty old. I was 28 mm -hmm. when I found the community. Um, and that was in 1991, so that's 21 years ago. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was a revelation to me. And quite frankly, uh, grappling with my submissiveness and um, realizing that I really was ultimately in control um, kind of changed my life. My entire career took off after then. I became an activist almost immediately. Mm -hmm. It really, um, it really was. Uh, a, became a passion to me because I was discriminated against almost immediately. I was, uh, I'm a writer. I write um, nonfiction books and I write science fiction novels. And um, I was working with a publisher at the time and I was in a triad uh, with a man and a woman, a couple. And he found out about it. I was outed by another writer oh, to wow. the publisher. And he took me out to dinner and he said, listen, you know, you're in a relationship with this man and this woman. So I really think that that means you could date me too. <gasps> I was like, this is your publisher? Yes. I was like, are you kidding me? No. <laughs> and um, that was it. I walked away, and I walked away from a good deal. And um, and my, but my life took a different turn. I mean, I would have been publishing more erotica, and um, and instead, what I ended up doing was um, uh, writing Star Trek novels. <laughs> Which turned out to be great for my career. Um, oh my god! And then I got around 2000. I started publishing my own science fiction novels. So, but when that happened, I was just like, "How could this possibly be?" And so I started volunteering immediately for the Leather Pride Night, which raised money for the Anti-Violence Project and Heritage of Pride Parade, and um, the Gay and Lesbian, you know, Community Center. Because at that point, we had to raise money and give it away in order to get people to support us. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that taught me a lot about community organizing because it was a bunch of different groups who came together to work on this project and I realized if you have a project you can get everybody headed in the same direction <laughs> and you can really make change. Yes. Um, so you know that work that we did with the Anti-Violence Project turned out to be extremely useful for the community later. Christine Quinn was in charge of the Anti-Violence Project at the time and now she's the head of the New York City um, the city council, uh -huh. and she's going to probably be running for mayor. And wow. she's very kink friendly, just because she was exposed to us when we were educating the New York City Anti Violence Project. Well, in the chat room, we have Dawn. She says, um, "Hope that I can help you in some way once I'm out, once I'm not so sick to raise some more funds for the 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 NC the NCSF or help in other ways. Um, what ways are there to help?" So what can we all do to help? Well, definitely join. Um, if we had, uh, like the ACLU, mm -hmm. if we had 3,000 members, we would be fine. Mm -hmm. So every person who joins, and it's $25, it's not very much money, uh, and that money goes directly to help people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that would be huge. Do a fundraiser. If your group is doing a fundraiser, or if you want to make a donation, we're, we also have a 501c3 foundation, so our donations are tax deductible. Um, and uh, we also have volunteer opportunities. Um, you can go to the NCSF website and um, look under volunteers, you know, how can I help? And we put up our different volunteer opportunities that we have. Fabulous. And Dawn said, I've been a member since you started. 
Yay. So she's been support <laughs> and we also have um, um, Darren that's come into the chat room. We have Little T. Little T came into the chat room, Little Taurus, and she said to me in the chat room earlier, who is this beautiful woman on the screen she's talking about you she thinks you're hot <laughs> <laughs> great <laughs> yeah she was up once a little tea used to live at little Taurus used to live in Los Angeles and she moved out to the East Coast so she's one of our East Coast um, um, viewers who've been watching us forever forever but um, and I'm glad so, to hear that because I'm getting to be an old lady now so. you're not an old lady <laughs> I'm gonna be 50 <laughs> I um, do you know how old I am <laughs> well, you know it's different nowadays, isn't it? You know, <laughs> Fifty is like the new thirty, <laughs> uh, and sixty is like the new forty. I'm sixty, yes. so, <laughs> and I haven't had this done yet. You know, I want to get that done. But uh, <laughs> so, so, where do you see? Where do you see yourself in five years? Give me, give me a. Uh, I'm going to put the camera right back on you, so it's just completely on you. Where do you see yourself in five years? Um, in five years, I think that this is a really important time right now for the kink community. Um, I would like to um, probably actually dive in more um, in terms of um, working on consent issues, blackmail in the community, bullying, um, and um, I'm hoping I can do that um, in a broader way. Uh, as well as continue the NCSF work. And I think that NCSF, uh, I think we're going to see the stigma subsiding more. Um, I think that the younger generation is much more open to what we are doing and understanding about the fact that as long as it's consenting adults and nobody's being harmed, uh, it's really nobody's business. And so I really think that in another five years we'll, um, we'll see, um, I'm hoping, we'll see some of these um, the damaging that's done by kinky people against kinky people easing off mm -hmm. um, because it really is it used to be the religious extremist that I was fighting and it's really come down to it's it's our own disgruntled people using the stigma against each other the Detroit incident that you were talking mm -hmm. about that was caused by somebody in the community yes um, that was not caused by somebody who had religious reasons or it, it, so that needs to stop. I would like. I'm hoping that that will subside over the next five years as um, as uh, the stigma also ebbs. Well, we we have so many. I mean, um, FetLife, FetLife, um, you know, has so much information there for someone. If someone doesn't know anything about BDSM, they can go to FetLife and they can discover a lot. One of my concerns about how we air our, la our dirty laundry is so publicly sometimes and I don't know if it's good for us or bad for us what is your opinion on that well you know I think for a long time we didn't talk about abuse in the community mm -hmm. because we were that was the stigma was that we're out there hurting each other um, and so we were fighting that stigma so hard that we didn't want to acknowledge that there are some predators out there that come into our community and, um, and there's also ignorant people who come into our community and, and hurt people on the basis of stereotypes. There's also people who are selfish and horrible mm -hmm. and just, you know, if they can take advantage of somebody, they, they will. And I think, that, um, I think that now we have to start talking about it. And I think that if we don't talk about it and acknowledge that this is happening and that we can change it um, as a community, um, I think it's it's not we're not going to have a community mm -hmm. because really what we are organized around is we're consenting adults. If we lose either one of those things, uh, you know, we really aren't a community anymore. We have to enforce our own standards. I, I agree with you 100%. It's really really hard because we can't really, as you said earlier, that there's no court in the United States that understands consent. They don't understand. I mean, we've got that new law in. I think it came beginning of the year. The um, the strangle, the yes. choking law, or the the breath play law. That even if we do that in play, we can still be arrested, and it's a felony in in and, California. And we, when we found out about that law, NCSF really contacted them, tried to get um, get that stopped, and and we we were quite shocked when we found out. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of states that have that law. That yeah. even if you you know put a hand on somebody's throat. Yeah. Um, it's uh, you know whether you squeeze or not. It's that you could run afoul of that law. 
And one of my concerns is we have so many fetish models that are out there with their faces all over the place in, and they're in the nude and they have someone's hand around their neck. Mm. Can that be used in, in a case of law? Can that be used against somebody? It, it could be. Um, it really depends on the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of prosecutors and DAs will say, we're not interested in, in prosecuting consensual BDSM. You know, they, they encountered it enough um, and they don't want to waste their time with it. Mm -hmm. um, but you always have these little cases kind of crop up and uh, where it's, you know, might be sensational, somebody's trying to gain a little bit of notoriety. That happened with Linda Fairstein mm -hmm. in New York City. She wanted to prosecute a consensual case, and we really did have to throw everything we had, um, including uh, the Anti-Violence Project in New York City, to, to defend us, to get that to stop. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's still kind of in a gray area right now. Uh, they could choose to do it, especially if they could go after a big company. Yep. Oh, they could go after um, kink.com. Right. You know, I mean, that could be used, I mean, one after another, after another, after another. I mean, it's mm -hmm. amazing. And I'm I'm pretty much, I don't, um, you know, I, I kind of go after what um, Jay Wiseman says, basically, about breath play, that you don't know what the person's heart valves are like. You don't know what their medical history is. So if you don't know, don't do it, because you, really, you could really kill somebody. If you're not really careful, and well, unfortunately, there are statistically there's deaths every year. Yeah, from people playing together, not realizing how quickly you can kill somebody by doing breath play. Um, so how do you, how do you deal? How how do you? I I know you have to be inundated with with emails and and people. I'm in this situation. I you know I was playing with my girlfriend and I did breath play on her. She I mean how do you? How, how do you deal with it? I mean, this is a lot on your shoulders. It really is. Um, it really is. I mean, um, that's why our, our, our volunteers are getting overwhelmed with it. Um, but unfortunately, in the cases of breath play, often, too often, what happens is the person who does it ends up killing themselves. Um, you know, they can't handle what they've done. Um, and we see that over and over again. Or they get arrested. And then they're, then they're busy, you know, in jail with their defense trying to mount a defense that what they were doing was not reckless or negligent, which is kind of hard to, to make that case, quite frankly, if you're choking somebody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people go to jail for it. And, and yeah, we have to look at that and, and say, okay, what do we do? We can't tell people don't do breath play because they're not going to listen to us. No, no. They're it's, not going to listen to us. And a lot of people say, it's edge play. I'm into edge play. We're, you know, I mean, the, the, um, the, the, what is it called? Rack kink aware. Yeah, risk aware consensual kink. I which mean, a lot of people subscribe to risk mm -hmm. aware consensual kink. Yeah, and it kind of changed the way that we do things. You know, it kind of because we had the safe saying and consensual. Now we're aware of the risk, and we but take we take it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> we take it anyways, and we take the responsibility. I mean, I just have to look at that and go. I mean, is it worth dying for? I mean, you really have to to evaluate that for yourself. Is is a sex game worth dying for? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, people people do. I mean, there's autoerotic asphyxiation. Yeah. I mean, doesn't everybody know how dangerous that is? I think everybody in in the United States knows that that's an extremely dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. And yet, people die from it, you know, regularly. Unfortunately. Well, a friend of mine was, um, he accidentally did a, a knife play thing was several years ago and he punctured, uh, punctured her lung. And it, went, it hit our community like wildfire and they were saying horrible things about him, that he was drunk and all this, and he wasn't. But the thing is, it really damaged his reputation for a very long time. And well, he's lucky he wasn't in jail. That Something similar happened here where they were doing knife play and the top accidentally cut the bottom he had to get 16 stitches or something like that and she's in jail wow yeah. wow yeah. and then that's wow yeah because because you 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 that falls afoul of the assault laws mm -hmm. well, you know I'm surprised that this guy who punctured a lung didn't well, didn't what, get 
arrested. Well, well, what happened is that we had a lot of people from the King community, you know, go to the police, you know, officers, and you know, and 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 talk about it. And it was the night before, um, the night before they were going to be having a town hall meeting about it and I refused to go to it because I knew that if I went publicly in a town hall meeting that we could any one of us could be used as a expert witness any one of us could have been so and I was and it was it was a it was a witch hunt you know they they were after him they were after you know after the organization that that um, you know put on the event and I couldn't be a part of it and it was the night before that the police officer said, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to press charges against you. We know that wow. you did not intend to do this. It was very it was, lucky. Very yeah, lucky because, yeah. uh, you know, intent is not often taken into account. Yeah, I know it isn't. And we, when we're doing risk, you know, things. I mean, tying somebody up. Um, you know, any one of us can tie the wrong knot in the wrong place if we don't know what we're doing. And that's, you know. That's one of my concerns about, you know, I know that, that Fifty Shades of Grey has brought in a lot of people, but they need to come in and be educated too. And yeah. that's one of my biggest fears is that people are going to get harmed if they don't educate themselves. Right. And I know FedLife is very committed to providing more education, mm -hmm. um, not just in the groups, but, you know, um, providing education from FetLife mm -hmm. uh, about these sorts of things, which I think is great because, quite frankly, a lot more people know about FetLife than they know about NCSF. <laughs> and uh, you know, if you can, if we can be providing this education at the source where people are coming into the community and learning about this, um, it could have a huge effect. A, a cute little story about John Baku. If he's watching this, he'll giggle. <laughs> he came into Los Angeles. He was going to be on my show, and he walked upstairs to my studio. And all of a sudden, he turned around and walked out of the studio. And I was like, I was doing a live show, and I was like, what the heck happened to him? And then he got on, and then finally during the break, he came back and he sat down on the couch, and he's talking. He goes, I didn't know that we were going to be live TV. He says, I thought we were radio. <laughs> so he went to go get changed. So we have, we have <laughs> photographs of him and I both doing you know, this with our phones. <laughs> you know, texting, and we look like two little geeks, you know, sitting there. And he was so, I mean, he's he's such a cool guy. I mean, I yeah. really enjoyed interviewing him. He's really laid back. I mean, he doesn't. He's come from the same place where I think that you are cut from, and that I'm cut from. That this is not about ego. This is about helping our community and making it strong. Well, he says that over and over again. Mm -hmm. He. You know, he his father was um, a hair stylist, mm -hmm. and he ended up uh, going to work for him when he was twelve. And uh, you know, seeing all of his his dad's gay friends mm -hmm. um, uh, surrounded by them in the you know late eighties, early nineties, and um, and he heard these stories of the persecution that they were facing, and and he he knew then that he really wanted to support people who could you know. People didn't have to feel alone. Uh -huh. They needed, you know. He really wanted to create a community for people, um, so that they wouldn't feel alone. So he wouldn't feel alone, because uh, he knew what that felt like. And uh, I think he did it. I think he did a great job with that one. Oh, I think he has too. And he told me he says that he's he's he had so many other websites that never took off. And this one, he said he had it for what a year or two years before it even started to even take off. At you know a little bit, and it was. Um, I think that it's massive information for the people that are into BDSM. It's a it's a it's a great place for us to talk about things like um, the um, TSR network and for uh, for your organization, National Coalition of Sexual Freedom. <laughs> It's that, dyslexia. it's that dyslexia. I know. It's really terrible when you can't put words to, that are in your head that you can't get them out. But um, it's really good for us to have a place like FetLife to be able to communicate together and to get the information out there. And as long as that, you know, it's a positive force. And what you've done with your organization is a positive force for us. And, and it's, you know, I want to ask you. You mentioned that you're a volunteer, okay? How many hours a week do you work? 
Ooh, it, it changes, but this past um, fall, I've been working a lot because I've been working on these different facts to try to get this information together. Um, so for the past six months, I've worked more than 20 hours a week, 20 yeah. to 30 hours a week. Um, and um, uh, my writing kind of took a back seat, although I did manage to write an erotic, uh, kinky romance. Uh, in this time, so you know. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you. The next question was, oh, so yeah, Shades of Grey taught me how to do it. Let me tell you. <laughs> I was like, why did I think of that? <laughs> um, I I think I think she got lucky. I mean, I have. Okay, I have to be honest. I've only read the first book, and I only got to page two hundred. I couldn't <laughs> handle it. You know, I couldn't handle G's or holy cow or holy shit or he has long fingers. He, I mean, I could not handle the repetition, you know. Yeah. I, I like, you know, I read romance novels not very often, but it's, it's certainly in my field because um, uh, I write, you know, science fiction fantasy and I, I always have a strong romance in it. Um, so, I mean, I loved it. I, you know, there's, it's so indefinable what makes a bestseller, what makes a hit. Um, and there's just something in those books that, um, I guess, speaks to people, uh, especially people who are vanilla. Yeah. Or, or haven't, or think they might be kinky but haven't explored it yet. I think it was put in enough of a vanilla context. Because they're really, when you read them, there's actually not a lot of BDS in No. <laughs> Really not. Um, you know, there's there's some power stuff, but you know, she's not really submissive, and so. But um, and then the and then the fantasy aspects of the romance novel are so extreme. You know, uh -huh. these military I mean, employees, right? But uh, I don't know. I don't know what it is about it. But yeah, it certainly helped show me. Um, uh, kind of the template, <laughs> but uh, mine has a, ho a whole lot more BDSM in it. <laughs> I would love to read it, and you know what? I think you need to write. A, I think you need to write a whole series of books about BDSM because you know That's about it. Good. You know, you 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 you're a writer. You know, and there's so many things you can do because there's there's just so much to explore. You can have people with fetishes. You can have people who are polyamorous. You know, you can have people who are master slave, DS, witches. Mm -hmm. um, so many different things you can do. It just it was easy. It flowed out like like <laughs> water. <laughs> I really um I found myself just in odd hours. It was just it just came. Well, I've so, taken I've taken my book off the market, and because my book is an erotic storybook for women, mm -hmm. and I've taken and I've added four BDSM stories to it, but they haven't been edited yet because you know you know my dyslexia, so everything mm -hmm. has to be corrected and edited and gone through, making sure that I do correct grammar, you know. But I can get a story. I could write a story, but I, I discovered something which is really interesting: is that we're doing a cookbook. To raise funding for TSR Network, and this might be a great idea for you, for 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 your company also, to reach out to the people that um, that donate and the people that are on your mailing list um, to send in cookbook. I mean, send in recipes as a fundraiser. Oh wow! There's a there's a thing called um, Cookbook Cafe. And it's it's an app. It's an i it's an iPad app, and you can go to bakespace.com, and it's a great great app. And people you can they can download the app and have all of the the cookbook. I mean all the the recipes, and it's free to do. And you can make money. And they've started it for people that want to raise money or fundraisers for um, for good organizations. And yours is an awesome organization that helps so many people. But I'd be glad to send you the information on it. I mean that would be great. We have we're getting ready to publish ours um, we've had and they do a group thing where people can they put the, their recipes in there and you don't have to do all the organizing of it. You just put the notices out there, which is great. I mean it's so easy to do. So we're going to be, we're waiting until after Christmas because I got um, 50 Shades of Taste. <laughs> that's so, great. So that's the name of the cookbook is 50 Shades of Taste. So, that's uh, great. <laughs> so, but you, a kinky cookbook. Yeah, kinky cookbook or, you know, you know. So, um, you know, those are good ways to do fundraisers that you can send out. Even, you know, if they send you a hundred recipes, recipes, you can break that up and make them into five different recipe books and, and, and raise wow. some funding on it. There's a lot of different ways to, to, um, to raise funding. 
but I, fo I found this one was was awesome. But uh, we I'm we're ready we're ready to we're only going to put um, 20 of the first recipes in it because we're waiting. We want to be able to do different series one, series two, series three, and to be able to raise money for TSR Network because we're also volunteers here too. None of us get paid. It's very people who think they can make a, a fortune on kink. It, they just really <laughs> you can't. <laughs> have no idea. <laughs> you, you can't, can you? I mean, no, you really can't. I mean, um, you know, it's very rare. Put it that way. Kink.com, you know, El James, <laughs> but you know, there's not very many people who are actually, um, you know, able to make uh, make money on kink. Mm -hmm. um, even even our businesses struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, to to survive. Yeah, I, I understand that thoroughly. Being when I lost my studio, that was a really hard thing for me. I still am recover, trying to recover from it. And it's you know when you put so many years. I mean, I've done TSR Network for the last eight or nine years, and I have I have one employee, and that's myself. Mm -hmm. And we were running we were running seven live shows a week. Oh wow! I mean, seven live shows and. All, all of our hosts were volunteers from Venus de Mila to Don Javier. I mean, they were Hudsey Hahn. I mean, they're spectacular people. And they're all waiting to come back, you know, when we get the studio space because we're not going to be doing it like we're doing it, you know, today because we ca I kind of like this, though. I kind of want to keep the little bit of this. This yeah. is kind of fun. <laughs> it's like a fireside chat. Yeah, this is, this is kind of <laughs> fun. But, you know, um, so... Any regrets that you have? Hmm. Any regrets? No, I'm actually not a big one for regrets because I tend to really, when I see something that I want to do, I just kind of go out and do it um, and try to get people to help me <laughs> do mm -hmm. it. So, uh, no, I actually feel pretty good about, um, I mean, when I started NCSF, I expected it to kind of, be there for a while and then fade away and be another brick in, in the wall that we're building um, with our activism and the advocacy. I had no idea it would continue on and it would help so many people. So that's hugely rewarding to see that happen and, and it's what keeps me coming back um, yeah. and doing this day after day. And you, you've had some, you've had some fundraisers. I understand that you've had um, locally here in Los Angeles. There's been some fundraisers with the Monarchs. They're all friends of mine, and um, yes. and the um, and the the Dragons, whatever. They, they're all friends of mine too, down in Orange County. Yeah, you know, the motorcycle group, um, right? BDSM. So, um, so if somebody wants to do a fundraiser for you, I mean, explain to the audience what they would do. I mean. I guess there's a certain. I've been looking at your site trying to figure it out. Oh, do you, it's very easy. Just contact us and say, "I want to do a fundraiser for you." Um, and you can either have the idea yourself, mm -hmm. or it's something that we can help with. We've got all different kinds of ideas. We've got like this fundraiser in a box idea. Fundraiser um, in a box? Yeah, it's like it's like everything you need to do a fundraiser, which is you know you need like the you might want the NCSF logo to put on your um, you know your flyer uh -huh. or on your website. Um, you know, a little information about NCSF, different ideas for fundraisers. You can do you know raffles, silent auctions. People, uh, you know, Taste of SM was a wonderful one where they kind of just set up all these different stations where you could, you know, newbies could come in and try different sensations. Oh, that's um, a great that, idea. It really is. A, and right now it's a very apt time yeah. to do it. So you have like a little introduction where you talk about consent mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, every person has to set their limit. And then people can either watch or they can participate. You know, lots of people want to try a violet wand, mm -hmm. you know. They haven't had a chance. Or, Blogging. Let's, let's see how that feels. Mm -hmm. um, that's a wonderful sort of fundraiser. But people, the imaginations are huge. It goes from passing the hat at a munch. We ask every group who joins NCSF as a coalition partner to do at least one fundraiser for us a year. Uh huh. I saw and, that. Oh my gosh! It's just the the inventiveness uh, of what people do. I mean, for something like Folsom Street East, which is the large um, street fair in New York City, they actually give us uh, a little bit of the door. Uh -huh. um, you know, a piece of the door for every person who comes in, um, and that's something that uh, we're thinking about asking events to do. Well, if you have a you know $125 you know registration fee, you could add $5 on that mm -hmm. and give that to NCSF. 
And I think people pe people did that at Fet Fest. They went for it. They they were able to actually add a little bit of money to go to NCSF, and it worked out great. Without them having to do much of anything, you know, they raised hundreds of dollars, um, and they raised awareness, which is also really important, so that the people who do need help know that we're here. Awareness is really important, and what what your organization does. I mean, nobody else does what you're doing, and I agree with you 100 percent that we need to get uh, positive information out there because um, many people are getting harmed and hurt, and it, it's our job as as seasoned players to kind of you know take the rope, seize it, and to get the education out there and to get um, the awareness to people. I mean, how when a woman goes to a doctor and they're all she's covered with bruises. I mean, how does one talk to a doctor? Yeah, we have. Um there's actually books that we recommend. Healthcare Without Shame mm -hmm. uh, is written by Dr. Charles Mosier, mm -hmm. and in it he just goes through. Here's how you can talk to your doctor about this. You know, here's how you can grow up to the subject, um, and it's very important because doctors are one of those people that have to report. Yeah. So if they don't understand, you can be in trouble, and your top can be in trouble. Um, so it's very important that you you understand that or have a kink aware doctor so that you don't have to do the explaining to them. So we can have, there's um, membership that you have, and which is really important. And do you also have group memberships for when there's groups at or is it just oh, yes. the organization? We have, yeah, we have supporting members mm -hmm. for groups, mm -hmm. um, and that's just like the individual membership. Uh, and then we have the coalition partners, the groups that want to take a more active role in NCSF, mm -hmm. commit to doing a fundraiser for us every year, and, um, and be, uh, you know, come to the coalition partner meeting once a year, to kind of help set the policy and the direction for what we're going to do for the next year. Okay, and volunteers. Let's talk about volunteers because you know people have stated in in the chat room that they were you know talking about volunteering. Um, what kind of volunteering do you need? What do you? What does your organization need? Right now, um, we've got uh, several different types of volunteers that we're looking for. Um, we're looking for media responders, people who can keep an eye on different media that, that's happening um, in their local area and nationally. I mean, some people are really online a lot and are out there kind of combing through and finding these kink-related stories and letting us know. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, you know, people sign up to do tabling. You know, in, like we do different events around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we go to different conferences, and people can sign up to help us do the tabling at those events. Um, we we have people who offer to help us who are, you know, lawyers. Um, I work with like a group of lawyers um, on all of these things, and I, I like to be able to consult with people. So if I'm contacted by a lawyer, I find out what their specialty is. If it's you know child custody, I uh -huh. I send them to Leany, who's running our incident uh, reporting and response with Leo right now. And, and they can help them, you know, if it's something like um, uh, uh, like a criminal attorney. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of need for a criminal attorney because I, I run a lot of this stuff past them to make sure that what we're talking about is right. Yeah. Well, it's really funny when I was going to be doing that march. <laughs> <laughs> I get my moments. <laughs> when I was going to be doing that march, I called up my ex-husband's wife, who's an attorney, and I asked her, I says, okay, I says, Deb, I got to find out how much it will cost to get... Yeah. Ah! What happened? I don't know. <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> That's hysterical. Play it over again. <laughs> Something's playing. Um, it's... I think that my TSR is up. I'm going to close that down. Um, let me get this closed. Okay, there we go. That's hysterical. So I called her up and I says, Deb, so I need to find out how much it will cost to get me out of jail. And she goes, what are you talking about, out of jail? I says, well, this is what I want to do. And I kind of explained it to her what I wanted to do. And this is what she said to me. And because, Susan, you're on the right track. I want you to know this. And this is, she said to me, do you realize that you, your, or your community is the last civil rights community that's out there that has not been able to come out yet? Mm -hmm. That's pretty empowering when you really think about it. And, and it's, you know, we've had discussions. Do we want to do a, um, like a coming out day? Uh-huh. 
but uh, we can't ask people to come out because there's still such danger. You know, they can lose their job, they can lose custody, they can get in trouble with their family. Um, so we're really, it's a catch-22. We need more people to come out, but we can't ask people right now. Well, that's what we did BDSM Pride Day. We did a seven-hour live broadcast for two years straight. We did an award show called TSR People's Choice Awards, and it was it was for people could to come out, and so many people were on the stage without mask, that are out in 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 plain view, and to me that was remarkable, and the reason why we wanted to do the kink awareness because we we wanted to emphasize the fact that some people cannot be out there that they have to wear a mask, and yes. it, and. It's a good way to get people out and involved. But, you know, picking the federal building might have not been a greatest idea. <laughs> <laughs> with people with masks on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> I get so silly. I get so silly. So, um, once, once again, your website for everybody. It's www.ncsfreedom.org. And this is this has been a, I I have really enjoyed this conversation. I've learned so much about you, and I'm I'm waiting to to read your your erotica, your BDSM erotica. I think it'd be great. I mean, you know what you're talking about, <laughs> so and you probably can really write. <laughs> well, I've written for a long time at this point, so <laughs> I definitely have that going for me. <laughs> so yeah, hopefully it's the the the. The right combination here. <laughs> but I would love to have you back on, and if you come into Los Angeles, I'd love to be able to have you on when we get our studio live. And if we're at DomCon this year, I would, you know, I don't know if you're going to have a booth at DomCon in, in Los Angeles. If you're, you know, if you're not, I would be glad to have some of your um, brochures and stuff on on our okay. on our table if we have it. You know, we haven't made a decision if we're going to be doing it yet because of the fact that we've been so closed you know for for quite a few months so I'll talk to Mr. Cyan who does a lot of also awesome fundraisers for a lot of people but um, I want to thank you Susan so much and I want to thank you for doing what you do for taking and volunteering taking this huge 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 responsibility on your shoulders because what you're doing for our our community is so important. We need representation of some sort in a positive vein, and you are bringing, you are bringing that to our community. I want to thank you so much for coming on to our, my show and and sharing with us. Well, thank you. I've really enjoyed it, and, and I appreciate what you're doing as well. You're spreading the news, which is what we need. You know, making it more accessible. Well, imagine felt life. You and I, I we we cream them. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to make strides. I think in a decade we'll really have made strides. Yeah. But this has been great, and I, I want to thank you so much. And I want to have you back on the show again. And okay, uh, great. And anytime you have any news or anything that you want to share with us, when we go back into our studio, you know, we'll be able to take, you know, um, do the same thing, get you, you know, on webcam and bring you back in. And uh, anything that you want to share with us, any, you know, and I'd be I'd love to do have a commercial for you. I oh, mean, that send, be great. send me the artwork of you know the logo and the stuff and I'll be glad to do it for you and uh, okay. add some music to it and you know, some whips or whip right. <laughs> whip cracking. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, great. Well this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you so much and um Goodbye, everybody, and I'm gonna put on the com Bye. on the uh, <laughs> on the last the ending. Yeah, I'm so used to having people doing this for me, you know. <laughs> Bye, Susan. Thank right, you. Goodbye. Don't go away. I want to speak to you. There we go. Whoops. The show is over. Rev Mel needs to go and masturbate. <laughs> We'd like to thank some groovy people. So watch their names on the screen and go tell them that they're great. Reverend Bell is a kooky nutty gal. I love her. Ooh, the show is over. But we'll be back so like look around the side or something. <laughs> Ooh, the show is over. 
She makes me feel funny in my no-no spot. <laughs>